In this lesson, we're going to go over the three most common judicial standards of review that are applied by the courts to determine the constitutionality of laws. Of course, we have rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. These are the standards of review that courts are going to most often apply to determine whether or not a law is constitutional. So if we're looking at a law school fact pattern or a bar exam fact pattern in constitutional law, how does this play out? How do we see this tested just from a big picture? Well, typically when we're seeing rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, strict scrutiny, when we're seeing these concepts really tested. We're going to most often see it in the context of individual rights. Think about your free speech analysis, your equal protection analysis, your due process analysis. You know, these are where we're really going to want to have a good understanding of what these standards of review are and how to kind of apply them to determine whether a law is constitutional or not. So if we're thinking in that context of kind of individual rights, our free speech analysis, our due process analysis, our equal protection analysis, how does this play out? on a fact pattern. How do we see this actually tested? Well, typically what we're going to have is first, the government is going to perceive a problem. Okay, usually this is some kind of societal problem and we don't really care whether the government is right or wrong, you know, whether it's a real problem or not a real problem, you know, that's really not for us to decide. All that we care is the government has, in their opinion, perceived some kind of problem. And what's typically going to happen is the government, of course, is going to want to alleviate this problem. So the government sees a problem, their objective is going to be, hey, let's alleviate this problem. So how do they alleviate it? Well, in these fact patterns, we're going to see the government basically pass a law to try to achieve this objective of alleviating whatever the problem is that they saw. So the government sees a problem, their objective is to alleviate the problem, so they pass a law to accomplish this objective of alleviating whatever problem they have perceived. Then what happens? Well, we're going to need a plaintiff, okay? So somebody's going to be negatively affected by this law. This law is going to get passed, and the way it's applied to somebody in our fact pattern, it's going to cause that person to sustain some kind of injury, right? We're gonna have a plaintiff who in some way is sustaining injury from whatever the law is, okay? It's going to negatively affect our plaintiff in some way. So of course the plaintiff is going to want the law struck down. If we're in constitutional law, they're probably going to challenge the constitutionality of the law in order to try to get it struck down. And they could do this on any grounds, right? They could challenge it under the First Amendment. They could say this is a violation of the Free Speech Clause of the First Amendment. It should be struck down. This is a violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. It should be struck down. It's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It should be struck down, right? Whatever the challenge is, okay, we'll deal with that. But what happens at the end of the fact pattern, once we've seen kind of all of this, right? The government has perceived a problem. The government's objective is to alleviate the problem. So to accomplish this objective, the government passes a law. This law negatively affects a plaintiff. So the plaintiff challenges the constitutionality of the law under some grounds. And then we get to the bottom of the question and the call of the question is basically going to ask you to play judge, right? It's going to say, hey, whoever's taking this constitutional law exam, play judge and determine whether the law is constitutional or not. And the good news is you usually have a standard of review that you can apply to that law to determine whether or not it is constitutional. Okay, the Supreme Court has kind of come up with these standards of review, these frameworks, these guiding principles that are used to determine whether laws are constitutional or not. So you will apply either rational basis, strict scrutiny, or some form of intermediate scrutiny to determine whether or not the law is constitutional. Some of you may be wondering, well, how do we know which standard of review to apply? How do we know when we're applying rational basis? How do we know when we're applying strict scrutiny? How do we know when we're applying some version of intermediate scrutiny? 
And this is a very complicated question, right? This is what we're going to spend the majority of our time in all of our lessons on individual rights exploring. You know, if you think about our free speech analysis, our equal protection analysis, our due process analysis, really the whole purpose of those frameworks, those step-by-step -step analytical frameworks, the conclusion we're trying to get at is what level of scrutiny are we actually applying? Okay, so that's why, you know, we go through and have all of those discussions and lessons. The whole purpose is to try to figure out what standard of review is the court going to apply to determine whether or not the law is constitutional. So the short answer to your question, if you're wondering, how do I know which standard of review to apply? It's kind of like, unfortunately or fortunately, you have to watch all of our lessons on constitutional law, all of our lessons on individual rights. All those analytical frameworks we have is basically the process you're going to have to follow to determine which standard of review we're applying. So that's not really what we're going to focus on in this lesson. That'd be impossible. It's like trying to cover a hundred years of jurisprudence and constitutional law in one lesson. What we're really going to focus on here is once we know what standard of review we're applying, we've worked through all of our analytical frameworks and we've determined we're applying strict scrutiny to determine whether the law is constitutional or not. In this lesson, what we're going to focus on is, okay, well, how do you do that? How do you apply strict scrutiny to that law to determine whether or not it's constitutional? That's going to be the focus, okay? And also, another benefit of a lesson like this is, we can also think about this video, this lesson, as kind of just like a glossary of terms. You know, as we work through our lessons on individual rights, many times you're going to hear me quickly in passing say things like, and then, so for these reasons, the court applied rational basis to the law, and ultimately the law was upheld as constitutional. And if we've seen this lesson, I don't have to explain rational basis every time I say it. I don't have to explain strict scrutiny every time I say it. After watching this, hopefully we all have a good understanding of these concepts. So it's kind of like a glossary of terms lesson as well. And it'll also be basically like the final step in all of our analyses. When we're thinking about free speech, equal protection, due process, what we're going to cover in this lesson is usually kind of the last thing we do at the conclusion of our analysis. So it's a good you know, glossary of terms video to have so we just know what these concepts mean. And it's also going to be helpful at the end of our analyses. Okay, but for those of you that are like me and you just want a big picture kind of idea, of when we apply these standards of review. Of course, the only way that we know when we're applying which standard of review is to watch all of our lessons on constitutional law and to understand all of those analytical frameworks. But if you're just looking for a big picture idea, one thing to keep in mind is typically, as we move this way on the board, basically we're seeing an increase in the constitutional value of whatever the area of law is that's being regulated by the government. So if the government is regulating in an area that has a lot of constitutional value, you know, the types of protections that are deeply rooted in our nation's history and tradition, you know, the more we're kind of in these areas that the Supreme Court has assigned a lot of constitutional value. You know, these are the things that the United States holds near and dear to its heart, like those types of constitutional protections, the more likely it is that the court is going to be inclined to apply strict scrutiny to that law. You know, a higher level of scrutiny because it's like, hey, this is a really important thing that the government is coming in and restricting. You know, if the government's coming in and they're regulating and they're restricting, you know, rights in some area, and those rights, those protections have a lot of constitutional value, the court's like, we gotta put the microscope on this law. We gotta really apply a heavy, strict level of scrutiny. Okay, so it's more likely we're going to be on this side of the board, basically as the areas the government is regulating in become 
higher in their value from a constitutional perspective, and that's basically just determined by the Supreme Court. Okay, And of course, the opposite is true. The less value that is assigned by the Supreme Court, like less constitutional value assigned by the Supreme Court, the more likely it is we come this way on the board and we apply something like rational basis, where the Supreme Court is saying something like, you know, the constitutional value is a lot lower here in this area that the government is regulating it. Basically, there's less at stake. So we can give a little bit of deference to the government here because essentially there's less constitutional value at stake. Okay, that's the big picture idea of kind of how the Supreme Court is determining what level of scrutiny or what standard of review to apply to determine the constitutionality of a law. But that's just a big picture concept. To really know exactly what standard of review we're applying, we have to go through all the step-by-step -step analytical frameworks that are laid out in all of our constitutional law lessons, okay? But that's enough of that. Let's just get into these things. Let's talk about how we actually apply these two laws to determine whether or not they're constitutional. The best way to do this is just with examples. So what we can do here is just take some laws, take some you know, common kind of hypotheticals, some common structures, some common laws, and try to see what would happen if we apply each of these levels of scrutiny to the law. Basically, what happens? And I think that will kind of illustrate best how each of these work. Okay, so let's just take a basic example. And we kind of talked about what the framework is of these fact patterns, so we'll stick to that because that's what you're probably going to see. So let's start with a middle of the road kind of protection that would be somewhere in intermediate scrutiny's territory. And then let's apply each level, each standard of review to see how it plays out. So imagine the following fact pattern. Remember, what's the first thing that happens? Government perceives a problem. So let's say the government perceives a problem. The government is looking out at society and they say, we think too many children are using tobacco products. Okay, this is a perceived problem by the government. Let's say the government believes that tobacco is very harmful to children. It can cause cancer, it can cause heart disease, it can cause all kinds of problems in children. So. Basically, the government sees that children are using tobacco at an alarmingly high rate. This is the problem that is perceived by the government. So the government is going to have the objective to alleviate this problem. So let's say the government wants to reduce basically consumption of tobacco by children to prevent the harms that tobacco cause to children. So that's their objective. So they're going to pass a law to try to achieve this objective. So we need a law that implicates constitutional rights. Let's pick the First Amendment. And this, by the way, is based on a real case. All of these examples I will base on real Supreme Court decisions, but I'm gonna kind of change a little bit of the facts here and there. So these are hypotheticals, but they're based on real cases. So let's say that the government's objective is to reduce the consumption of tobacco products by children. So they pass a law. That's their objective. The law that they pass is targeting tobacco advertising. Let's say the government says, hey, look, if we can get less tobacco advertisements around children, that should reduce the demand that children have for tobacco. It should decrease the consumption of tobacco being used by children. And ultimately, that's going to prevent all of these harms that tobacco causes from you know, occurring in these children. So they develop a regulatory scheme. scheme. They pass a law that basically says Tobacco advertisements are not permitted within 1,000 feet of elementary schools, public parks, public playgrounds, you know, high schools, middle schools, anywhere where children, people under the age of 18 are likely to congregate. And then there's like a list, say within 1,000 feet of public parks, public playgrounds, public elementary schools, public middle schools, 
within a thousand feet of any of these areas, there is no advertising of tobacco products allowed in any form. Okay, so the government passes this law. They've perceived a problem. Children are being affected by, children are being negatively affected by using tobacco products. It's causing bodily harm and maybe even death. Okay, so their objective is to prevent this. They're trying to alleviate the problem. To accomplish this objective, they pass a law that targets tobacco advertising that could be placed near children in places where children are likely to congregate. Okay, so what happens next in these fact patterns? Well, we know we need a plaintiff. Someone has to be harmed in some way by this law. So who would be kind of someone who would be harmed by a restriction on tobacco advertising? Well, of course, the tobacco companies, right? I imagine the tobacco companies would not be thrilled with this kind of regulation. So imagine that a tobacco company you know, sues. The tobacco company becomes our plaintiff. It doesn't matter what tobacco company. A tobacco company, though, comes along and says, hey, look, this is a violation of our freedom of speech under the First Amendment. This is in violation of the free speech clause of the First Amendment. We're challenging the constitutionality of your law. You know, we have the right to express our ideas, especially, I mean, think about it. This is truthful advertising of lawful activity. We absolutely have the right to express our ideas on tobacco. This is freedom of expression under the First Amendment. It's being restricted by the government. So they challenge the law under the First Amendment. Okay, then we would get to the bottom of the fact pattern. And it's going to ask you, Determine whether or not the law is constitutional. Explain. Remember, at the bottom, the fact pattern is going to ask you to play judge, and it's going to say, determine whether or not this law is constitutional. How do you do this? Well, you're going to have to apply a standard of review. You know, you don't just like make stuff up. We have these, you know, established standards of review that courts use to determine whether or not a law is constitutional. So you'll go through all the analytical frameworks. Again, you'll have to watch our you know, entire series on free speech. You'll have to go through that entire step-by-step -step process. Remember, whether the law is within the scope of the First Amendment, then you have to think about the state action requirement, then you have to think about overbreath, vagueness doctrines, and other threshold speech issues. Then you'll have to determine whether the, call, whether the law is content neutral or content based. Here, it's likely that the law is content based. And then once you determine that it's content based, you'll have to think about, well, is this a protected category, unprotected category of speech? You'll go through this long analytical framework. And in that case, you'll actually arrive at the conclusion, if we go through the analysis correctly, that that falls under basically the unprotected speech category of commercial speech. We have this whole kind of step-by-step -step analysis with commercial speech. There's a really seminal case there, Central Hudson Gas. That's the standard of review that you'll apply. It ends up being a modified version of intermediate scrutiny. But let's ignore that, okay? Because really what we're focusing on in this lesson is just applying all of these standards of review. How do each of these work? So. We know in that case, the court would actually apply a modified version of intermediate scrutiny to determine whether that restriction on tobacco advertising is in violation of the First Amendment. Okay, but here we can just say, look, this is a hypothetical. Let's apply rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny to that law to see what would happen at each level. How would the result change when we're applying rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, and strict scrutiny. So let's say in this case that the court was applying rational basis to determine whether this law was constitutional or not, whether this restriction on tobacco advertising is constitutional or not. Well, we see here under rational basis, the challenger must prove that the law serves no legitimate government interest or the law is not rationally related to achieving a legitimate government interest. So the commonality we're going to see between all of these standards of review is the two features of each one kind of follow a similar pattern. Okay, the first feature of each standard of review focuses on how important the government interest is behind passing the law. Remember, 
We have to know what the objective is the government is trying to achieve by passing the law. Remember, we said the way that these fact patterns play out, it's going to be number one, the government perceives a problem. The government's objective is to alleviate the problem, and they do this by passing a law. So we want to know what is the objective that the government is trying to achieve by passing the law. And when we're thinking about this first feature, right, in each of these standards of review, what we're really asking is, on a spectrum, how important is this objective? How important is this objective that the government is trying to achieve by passing the law? And we kind of see that we have three baseline points. We have the idea of a legitimate government interest. As we move down the spectrum, we have the idea of an important government interest. And as we move all the way down to the end of our spectrum, we have a compelling government interest. So under rational basis, all that's required for the law to be upheld is that the interest is legitimate, okay? This is the lowest end of our spectrum. When we're thinking about this spectrum is basically how important is the objective that the government is trying to achieve by passing this law? If we have to like rank that, how important is it? All that's required under rational basis is that the law is legitimate. Okay, so what is the government's objective here? What is the government trying to achieve by passing this law in our fact pattern? Well, they're trying to prevent children from serious bodily harm and death. It's all about preventing cancer and heart disease in children. Would we say that this is a legitimate government interest? Of course, right? There's no doubt protecting children from serious bodily harm or death is a legitimate government interest. Is that an important government interest? Even though we're not applying intermediate scrutiny, let's just, I mean, just think about it. Is protecting children from harm or death a important government interest? Probably, right? I mean, the, in fact, I would say in most cases, that's going to be a compelling government interest. Anytime we see the government is protecting children from death or serious bodily harm, this is like one of our highest levels of interest the government could have. Anytime the government's really protecting the health, safety of large segments of the population, that's probably a compelling government interest, right? Which means it's important, which means it's legitimate, okay? And in fact, what we see is most government interests are legitimate. Even if it's trivial, say the government's trying to increase tax revenue 0.3%, right, whatever, something kind of trivial. Is that a legitimate government interest? Yeah, that's legitimate. Is it important or is it compelling? Probably not. You know, a slight increase in tax revenue, again, it depends on the facts. We'd have to see everything. But just off the cuff, you know, a small increase in tax revenue, probably not a compelling government interest. Maybe could be important depending on the facts, but probably not an important government interest. It's more trivial. But it's definitely a legitimate government interest. It's hard for a government interest, for the government to have an objective that's actually not legitimate. You know, one of the best examples of this, which you'll see cited, and there's not a whole lot of case law out there that exists that, you know, demonstrates what an illegitimate government interest actually is. I mean, there's only a small handful of times where the Supreme Court has actually said, hey, this interest isn't even legitimate. And one of the most kind of seminal cases on this would be basically United States Department of Agriculture v. Moreno. In that case, what you had was basically, for lack of a better way of saying it, the government had the objective to prevent hippie communes from receiving food stamp benefits from the government. Basically, the government passes this law that says, hey, if people you know, that aren't direct relatives, live in the same household, they can't get government food stamps, and they laid out like all of these exceptions that covered a lot of things, but it didn't cover like communes where quote unquote hippies lived. You know, and of course hippies referring to, this case is from the 70s, you know, members of the counterculture that, uh, 
you know, disagree with societal norms, you know, and are forming their own communities in the 70s, this kind of political group is being referred to as the government as hippies, okay, in the 70s. And in that case, the government says, like, or in that case, it goes up, the Supreme Court says, that that's not a legitimate government interest. You know, the government does not have a legitimate interest in preventing a political group that they disagree with from getting food stamps. You know, that's not legitimate, okay? That's not a legitimate government interest. So you have to be like pretty low on the spectrum. Like the government really has to be you know, reaching to get an actual, to have an objective that is actually not legitimate. I mean, most things, if it, even if it's trivial, are going to be considered legitimate. And it's also important to recognize when we're applying rational basis, the burden here is on the challenger, not the government. The person who is challenging the constitutionality of the law is going to have to bring forth the evidence, is going to have to say, look, this, the challenger must prove that the law serves no legitimate government interest. So if the court looks at it, it basically the court can conceive any way that the government could have had a legitimate interest here, they're supposed to say, okay, that is legitimate. Even if the government doesn't bring evidence that they had a legitimate government interest, if it's conceivable, okay, because the challenger has the burden to prove that the law serves no legitimate government interest. Basically, the challenger has to say, here's all the evidence that shows why the government could not have possibly had. There's no conceivable way the government could have had a legitimate government interest. This is a very, very difficult thing for the challenger to prove. And in fact, it's only happened, you know, a handful of times. Okay. And one of the biggest examples there would be United States Department of Agriculture v. Moreno. Okay. So that's our first feature though, of each of these levels of scrutiny. It's all about basically ranking on our importance spectrum you know, how important is the objective that the government is trying to achieve by passing the law? Okay, and we can kind of visualize it with this spectrum. The next question that we're going to see in all of these standards of review, the second feature we're going to see is all about the connection between the government interests and the law itself. You know, if we're thinking about what is the objective the government is trying to achieve by passing the law? And our first question is about kind of determining how important that objective is. The next question is, what is the causal connection between the objective and the law itself? Can we see a relationship, you know, between the law and the objective the government is trying to achieve by passing the law? We need to see that relationship, that link. And basically, how perfectly that relationship fits together, basically what is required for that connection to be sufficient, changes drastically as we move from rational basis to intermediate scrutiny to strict scrutiny. Strict scrutiny, we're going to see, basically has to be a perfect fit. Rational basis, we see that the challenger has to prove that the law is not rationally related to achieving a legitimate government interest. If we visualize this, kind of these squares, these rectangles we have drawn on the board, imagine that these rectangles are like cakes, like flat sheet cakes. And what we have in situations like this, where the government is restricting. Think about any time that the government is actually like restricting rights. They're taking away rights, you know, or they're regulating or restricting rights in some way. Like in this case, they're actually restricting how, you know, people can express their ideas when they're saying, you know, you can't advertise tobacco products in these spaces, in these ways. Right, they're kind of taking away rights. They're restricting First Amendment protections. We should literally visualize that as our entire cake, right? This rectangle right here. This entire cake represents like freedom of speech. And the government is coming in and they're carving out like a section of that cake. They're saying, look, you can't speak freely in this little thing that we are carving out from freedom of speech First Amendment. 
okay? With this tobacco advertising regulation, they're cutting out a piece of that cake. So the dotted lines kind of represent the government's law in these. So the rectangle all the way around, the bordering rectangle here represents the entire cake, the entire First Amendment, basically. And of course, this isn't drawn to scale. Like, obviously, in this example, this cake would be like the size of the board, and the piece they're cutting out is like relatively small. But just for our purposes, this isn't drawn to scale, but just to like see what it looks like. They're carving out a piece of that protection, okay? And so, when they're doing this, under rational basis, the question is just that there's a rational relationship between the government's target objective, which is basically the green lines, and basically what they've cut out. And here, the piece that they've cut out, right, it's way bigger than it probably has to be. When we think about how much of free speech they're cutting out, they're carving out a really big piece. But in that piece, they are probably achieving their objective here. When we think about what the objective is, they're trying to reduce the demand basically from children for tobacco products. If they go and they reduce the amount of advertising that children see, okay, if less children are seeing advertisements for tobacco, that's going to lower the demand that children have for tobacco. Less kids use tobacco, products, less kids are going to have the bodily harm and other damages that the government is trying to prevent. So we can clearly see the relationship behind the rational relationship behind this law, right? Basically restricting the way tobacco companies can advertise in places where children congregate to reducing basically harm caused by tobacco to children. Like we can see that relationship. Now, if we visualize it though, it's not like a perfect relationship. The government is targeting way more than they have to here to achieve that objective. Think about it. Imagine that we took out a map and we pinned all of these locations. Take like New York City, a really populated, congested city. And say we went and we on the map, we put a pin in Everywhere there's a public park, everywhere there's a public playground, everywhere there's a school, an elementary school, a middle school. Because remember, the regulation the government passed in this case was basically no tobacco advertising within a thousand feet of public elementary schools, public middle schools, public parks, public playgrounds. So imagine we looked at a map and we put those pins in at each of those locations. And then we drew, you know, a thousand feet diameter circles around each of those locations. And then we looked at the map. What it would probably turn out if we did that is almost the entire city would be circled, which means effectively by passing this regulation, there can be no tobacco advertising in the entire city in any format. People basically can't verbally advertise tobacco, so like people can't even really talk about tobacco products. There can't be any signage, any radio, any advertisements of any kind of tobacco in an entire city. So think about that. That means they are carving out a huge piece of the First Amendment pie. If we think about the First Amendment cake here, they are cutting out a massive piece, way more than they need to, to achieve their objective of just preventing children from you know, using tobacco products. Okay, so we would say that's probably a substantially over-inclusive law. When we're thinking about this second element, that's what this label is, right? It's substantially over-inclusive, and that's what the red represents. The red kind of represents the burden, the additional burden, the extra burden they're placing on free speech when they pass this law. They're carving out way more than they need to, okay? But the good news for the government here is if we're applying rational basis, that's kind of okay. It doesn't have to be a narrowly tailored law. It doesn't have to be a perfect fit. They are allowed to carve out more than they need to if we're applying rational basis. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program or LEAP 
for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no risk, free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap. Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else. Um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudicata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're gonna do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Sudicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.